The same company that brought us Dire Wolves has also brought us the Woolly Mouse, and it's a step closer towards reviving Woolly Mammoths, and what they're intending to do really isn't all that far-fetched. Creating a woolly mammoth with these kinds of methods is actually rather easy to accomplish. The woolly mouse was created by tweaking a few genes that have to do with coat. Here we can see a regular mouse and one with a genetic modification. This comes out of a company called Colossal, who has been involved in a lot of resurrection science that revolves around altering genes. What you have to understand, though, is that something that looks like a direwolf is not actually a direwolf. Previously thought to be related to modern-day gray wolves, while they do share a lot of genes because they are canids, are actually part of an extinct line of canines that no longer exist on Earth. But they can create something that at least looks phenotypically, so the way its physiology demonstrates itself, like the direwolves we know and love from Game of Thrones. Now, I did want to clarify something. When I say that these guys do not have a place to live, that they weren't designed to live on a zoo or even on 200 acres, you have to understand what I'm saying is that nature designed direwolves. Through billions of years of evolution, little quirks in the environment shaped every creature to what they are today. Are we adapted for what we're living in? Not well. These mutant puppies have nowhere on Earth that they are adapted to live in, because they weren't designed by nature itself. They were made because we thought they would look cool. There's no niche for them to fit in and no natural prey. Worse, if you know anything about Texas, where people have game reserves, there's some African animals that are extinct in the wild, but live in Texas, where they've established populations. Yes, animals always get out. Ask me about California's wild zebra population sometime. Yes, there is a population of feral zebras roaming California to this day. It's always a fear that genetically modified critters will find their way into nature and have unpredictable results. It's why, in my work, when I have GMO bacteria, we do have very careful protocol. We can't just flush them down the drain. Now, our dire wolves are about as much a dire wolf as a Shiba Inu is a fox. Yes, we can make dogs that look very similar to a fox, but they will never be a fox. This is a little bit like imagining an alien race abducts a chimpanzee and wants to recreate humans. So they think, oh, well, it needs to be slimmer and hairless. There you go, a human. Now, one of the reasons that this route is taken, like if we can just engineer an elephant to be furry, that's the same as a mammoth, right? That's because for many of these extinct critters, there is no analog, nothing that's even remotely similar to them. An example would be the Silocene. This is a marsupial that simply doesn't exist anymore. Their closest relative is not something that could actually carry it. This is why artificial wombs may be a great step farther for resurrection science. While we do have the entire genome of a woolly mammoth, we can't exactly pop it in an African elephant to hope for the best. We don't know what hormones or what genes need to be activated throughout the reproductive process for that to be a healthy critter, and elephants are not doing that well already. We have an environment that's doing desperately poorly already. We don't need to bring back these animals. And yes, while they are not selling pets yet, I'm sure if there's enough of a demand, you can get your own dire wolf or woolly mouse.